So hello everybody. Sorry. Um, so today we're going to be listening to France Gerhardt from the, the University of Liège, and she's going to talk about aesthetic characterization, characterization sorry, of dendritic languages, the ternary case. So please, France, if you could start whenever you want. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to talk today. So hello, everyone. I will explain to you how we can obtain an aesthetic characterization of dendritic languages. And I will focus more specifically of the case where the alphabet contains three letters, the Turner case. And the results I present today are a joint work with Marie Lejeune and Julien Leroy. Okay, so before going, sorry, okay, now it works. Uh, before uh, going into the depth of the uh, topic, let me fix some notations. So we work with finite alphabets. I see there are some messages. Okay, no. Uh, we, we have finite alphabets, A, B, or sometimes it's indices. And on these alphabets, we consider factorial languages. And more specifically, we consider uniformly recurrent languages. So every word will reappear, and it will reappear with a bounded gap. And these languages will be denoted with some variation of the letter L. And on these languages, I apply morphisms. And what I get is the image of a language under a morphism, which I denote with this notation, so small f here, uh, to say that I do not only take the images of the words, I also take all of the factors. So that if L is a uniformly recurrent language, then so it's so is its image. No. Uh, okay. Now I will define more specific notions. And first, the notion of aesthetic representation. So, an aesthetic representation of a language is a sequence of morphisms that can be defined on different alphabets, but alphabets of, of uh, consecutive morphisms have to coincide. And this sequence is such that, in some sense, the language is the image of the sequence. So the words of the language are exactly the words that appear in the image with some prefix of the sequence. And to avoid some specific cases, uh, I only consider primitive representations. But since I work with uniformly recurrent languages, it's not really a problem. It's not really a restriction. And what does it mean that the sequence of a morphism is primitive? Well, essentially, uh, if I fix some index by going far enough, I will see all the letters in all the images, but it's not really important uh, for this talk. And what we want to do with aesthetic representation is to characterize and know the properties of the languages based on the properties of the sequence just like we can uh, do it with a fixed point of morphisms. And the question more specifically is, well, given a family of languages, can we uh, say that the languages in this family are exactly the languages that have an aesthetic representation that satisfies some conditions? And the first family of languages that we study is often the family of Turmian languages. And we indeed have an aesthetic characterization of this family which basically uh, says that the sequences uh, uh, have only two different morphisms that are given morphisms and are not, are not uh, eventually constant. We also have a characterization for our languages, which is pretty similar. And we have also a static characterization for other families of languages. And as you've probably understood by the title of my talk, well, the question is, given the family of dendritic languages, can we find a condition C that, that characterizes it? So to do that, I need to define what is a dendritic language. And I need the notion of extension graph. So given a word W in our language, we can define a set of left extensions of W which are the letters that can be seen on the left of W. And similarly, the set of right extensions of W are the letters that can be seen on the right of W. And then the by extensions of W, or just the extensions of W, 
are the couples of letters A, B that can be simultaneously on the left and on the right of W. And these sets can be represented in a bipartite graph called the extension graph of W. So the left vertices will be the left extensions, the right vertices will be the right extensions, and we connect these vertices using the by extensions. So for example, in the Fibonacci language on the alphabet 0, 1, if we want to know what is the extension graph of the empty word, well, we need to look at the left extensions of the empty word. But basically, all the letters can be seen on the left of the empty word. And the right extensions is also all the letters. So that's why we have 0, 1 on the left and 0, 1 on the right. And now the by extensions, well, in the case of the empty word, it's simply the factors of length 2 in our language. So 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0. And for the extension graph of the word one, well, I know that every time I see a one, it can only be preceded by a zero and it can only be followed by a zero. So that means that one only has one left extension, which is zero and one right extension, which is zero. So also only one by extension. We now say that the word is dendric if its extension graph is a tree. And if all the words in the language are dendric, then we'll say that the language itself is dendritic. So this notion was introduced in 2013 by Berthe de Felice Dolce Le Roi, Berhard Rottenau, and Randon. And later, the, this condition that all the words are dendritic was relaxed by only asking that all the long enough words are dendritic. And this gives us the notion of eventually dendritic, which was studied by Dolce and Perrin. But in this talk, I will only consider dendritic languages because actually we will see, and I will explain to you later, that uh, knowing an aesthetic characterization for dendritic languages will imply that we also have an aesthetic characterization for eventually dendritic languages. So that's why we only look at dendritic languages. It is sufficient. So you all know some example of dendritic languages because, well, this definition generalized the notion of Arnorosi languages and also the notion of codings of regular interval exchanges. So in particular, it also generalized the notion of Trumian languages. And still they have some linear complexity. So this family has some very nice properties and some of them are related to the notion of return words. So I need to define to you what is a return word. A given a, a word W, which is non-empty, a return word is basically what happens between two consecutive occurrences of uh, W in our language. So more precisely, it is a word uh, U that can be followed by W. And if it is followed by W, then of course, W is a suffix, but W is also a prefix, and there's no occurrence in between. There's no internal occurrence. So it begins at the beginning of an occurrence of W, and it ends right before the beginning of the next occurrence of W. So let's go back to our example with the Fibonacci language. And if we look at the return words for zero, well, two consecutive occurrences of zero are either directly consecutive, and in that case, the return word is just zero, or they are separated by one. And if they're separated by one, that means that the return word is zero, one. And these are the only two possibilities. And if we look at two consecutive occurrences of one, well, they can be separated by one zero or by two zeros. So this gives us the return word one zero and one zero zero. And as you see here, we have two return words for zero and two return words for one. And this result is much more general than that because the Fibonacci language, of course, is dendritic. But we have this result, which I only stated here in the dendritic case, but it's even more general than that. And it says that the number of return word is equal to the number of letters in the alphabet in the language. So this is already a nice property that dendritic languages have with respect to return words, but we have even stronger properties. I will not go into details about them because I will not use them directly. What I use is one of the consequence. And this consequence is related to 
the notion of derived language. So what is a derived language uh, with respect to some word? Well, essentially every word in the language L, you can cut it into blocks and these blocks will be return words for W. You cut before each occurrence of W, maybe you have some beginning and some end which are not complete, but you don't really care. And then the blocks in between are return words for W. And you can code these blocks using some morphism that will associate to each return word a letter. And if you do this coding, what you get is a new language called the derived language. Uh, he, this is the more def uh, formal definition, but the idea is what I've explained. And this new language is such that if you apply this morphism, what you get is the original language. And the property that uh, the family of uniformly recurrent dendritic languages has is that it is stable under this operation. So if the language L is a uniformly recurrent dendritic language, then the derived language is also a uniformly recurrent dendritic. And this property is uh, the beginning of, of uh, everything that I will say later because it allows us to build some aesthetic representation of dendritic languages. And here is how, well, we have some dendritic language L on the alphabet A, and we take some non-empty word in the language. And if we derive with respect to that word, what we get is a new language, which is still on the alphabet A because we have as many return words as letters. So we can assume that we stay on the same alphabet. And we have also a morphism that will code the return words and it, which is such that, well, the image of L1 under this morphism is the original language L0. But by the previous result, this new language is once again dendritic, uniformly recurrent dendritic, and we can start again. We can pick a non-empty word, derive with respect to that non-empty word. This gives us an, a language L2 and a morphism sigma1, and we have this equality here. And we can keep going, and this gives us an aesthetic representation, a primitive aesthetic representation of the language. So we know that every dendritic language has a primitive aesthetic representation that is built using this algorithm. But what we want is an aesthetic characterization. So we also want, to, in a way, the converse result. We want that if a language has an aesthetic representation that satisfies some conditions, then it is dendritic. And so the goal here is to understand what are the properties of the sequences that we build using this algorithm and can we understand these properties with enough precision so that we have the converse result? And so that's what we will do now is to try and see what are the properties of these sequences. So the first thing that we can notice is that, well, at each step, the morphism that we have codes the return word for some word and in some language. So these morphisms, we call them recurrent morphisms. So these are injective morphisms such that, well, the images of the letters have in some sense the potential to be return words for W. So what do we mean by that? It means that if it is followed by W, then W is a suffix, a prefix, and there's no internal occurrence of W. And indeed, if we have such a morphism and we apply it on some language, well, the, the, the image of the letters will be the return words. So this will actually be a morphism that codes the return words for W in our image. So let's give two examples. On the left, we have the morphism sigma, which is such that zero is a prefix of each image, as we can see here. So zero is a good candidate for W. And indeed, if we imagine that we have zero at the end here, there's exactly two occurrences of zero each time as a suffix and as a prefix. So sigma is indeed a return morphism for zero. And in this case, since the word W is actually just a letter, these morphisms are also known as strongly left proper morphisms. And if you look on the right, 
for the morphism tau, we see that zero is once again a prefix of all the images, but it also appears later. So zero is not a good candidate, but zero one is because indeed if we imagine that we have zero one here at the end, we have exactly two occurrences of zero one each time. So tau is a return morphism for zero one, but we can also see that it is a return morphism for zero one zero. So this W is not unique, but it's not really a problem. Okay, so now we know that, well, at each step, since our morphisms could return words for some word in some language, then at each step, the morphisms that we have uh, are return morphisms. So from now on, we assume that we only work with return morphisms, and these are the only morphisms that we have. Okay, so the second observation is that the reason why we were able to iterate or process was because every intermediary language was dendritic. And so we want to know whether it is difficult to have this property that we have a dendritic language and apply some morphism and what, you, what we get is once again dendritic. So we want to understand when does this happen? So we, have, we assume that we have some dendritic language L and we have some return morphism sigma. And we want to look at this image here and know when is it dendritic. But by definition, if we want to know when this image is dendritic, we have to look at the extension graphs. And so we want to know, well, what does this extension graph of the word U in the image looks like? And to do that, we have to separate separate into two cases. So the first case is when U does not contain any occurrence of the word W. So this is what's written here. And in this case, we say that U is an initial factor. And the other case is when U contains at least one occurrence of W, and then we say that U is an extended image. So we now have to consider these two cases. So for the first one, if U does not contain any occurrence of W, well, in some way, every occurrence of U cannot overlap too many images of letters. And actually, every occurrence of U is an internal factor of the image of a letter followed by the word W. And what I mean by it, internal factor is that not, it's not prefix nor a suffix. So you can also occur as a prefix or as a suffix, but what's important is that it occurs as an internal factor. But what, what we're looking at is the extension graph. Of you. And so that means that we want to know what are the letters that I can add before you and what are the letters that I can add after you. But since U is an in internal factor of this, well, adding a letter before and after is still a factor in this. So that's what's written here. AUB is a, 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 a word in our image, if and only if it appears as a factor in some word this. But now if I define F sigma as the set of all these factors, well, this equivalence here can actually be seen as this equality. Here. The extensions of U in the image are exactly the extensions of U in this set. So here F sigma is a finite language, which is, it is the only time we have a non-uniformly recurrent language in this talk but the definition of extension graph is obviously the same. And so that means that now we want to know when is this graph on the left a tree? But we, that means that we only need to look at the graph on the right and this does not depend on the language L since F sigma is just, it only depends on sigma. And so that means that the fact that U is dendritic in the image is a property of sigma and not of sigma and L. So we can define the notion of dendritic return morphism, which is a return morphism such that all of these small words are dendritic in the image. So let's look at some example. If we have the morphism sigma from before, which is a return morphism for zero, and if you apply sigma on any uniformly recurrent language, well, we know that every occurrence of two in the image will be inside one of these blocks and both blocks will appear at some point 
So that means that the extensions of two are 0, 1, 0, 2, 2, 2, and 2, 1. So we have this extension graph for two, and it does not depend on the language. It only depends on the fact that we applied this morphism. But as you can see here, this graph is not a tree. So two is not dendric. And the morphism sigma is said to be not dendric. And if you look at the morphism tau from before, well, I have to look at the internal factors in here and look at their extension graph in this, in these words. But actually, I don't need to look at all of the internal factors because if there's only one left vertex in the extension graph, then the graph is a tree. And if there's only one right vertex, then the graph is also a tree. Sorry, uh, what? Okay. So, um, what was I saying? Okay. So we only need to consider the words such that the extension graph have, have at least two left vertices and at least two right vertices, which are called the bispecial words. And there are only three bispecial words, the empty words zero and one zero. And all of their extension graphs are trees. So the morphism two is dendritic. So that means that if we only look, look at the initial factors, then sigma cannot appear in our sequences because some initial factor is not dendritic, but two can appear in our sequences. Now we need to look at the extended images. And if u contains at least one occurrence of w, then we can do the same trick as we did to obtain the derived language, which is to cut before each occurrence of w. And what we get is a first block, which is possibly empty. So that's what, uh, what is before the first occurrence of W. And this block we denote it with S. Then we have some complete block, uh, which corresponds to the image of a letter. So since we have several blocks, this gives us the image of a word. And then the last block begins with W, but we don't really know where it ends because there's no other occurrence of W. And so this block is the word P. So this decomposition is obviously in unique. And every time we have an occurrence of U in the image, well, we can see it as an internal factor of some word like this. So, and it is such that S is a proper suffix of sigma of alpha, and P is a proper prefix of sigma of beta followed by W. And the, no, the, the name extended image comes from this decomposition here, because as we, see, as we can see, we take the image of V and we extend it. So we'll more specifically say that U is an extended image of V. And since every occurrence of U is as an internal factor of some word like this, then we can do the same trick as for initial factors. And we know that AB is an extension of U if and only if we have this condition here. So there exists alpha and beta such that AS is a proper suffix of sigma of alpha and PB is a proper prefix of sigma of beta W. And what we want is to know, well, when is, well, not the, it, this is not the extension graph, but when is the extension graph of U a tree? So we have to understand what is this relation here that we have. So I've just rewrote it here. And it's assumed that we have the morphism two from before and that this is the extension graph of B. Okay. Now we want to know what is the extension graph of this word U, which is one zero, sigma of V zero one zero. So essentially S is one zero and P is zero one zero. Well, if I look at what's written here, I have to consider the extensions of V. So let me first copy the extensions of V. But among the extensions of V, not all of them will be useful because if S is not a proper suffix of sigma of alpha, then alpha beta will never satisfy this condition here and will never give me some AB. So I have to remove uh, all of the extensions such that S is not a proper suffix of sigma of alpha or P is not a proper prefix of sigma of beta W. So let's look here at our morphism. What does it mean that 
one zero is a proper suffix of sigma of alpha. Well, it's not the case for zero since we have to look only at the black part here. So all edges which have zero as a left vertex will not be useful, but it is the case for one and for two. So I have to remove these edges with zero as a left vertex. And then for the condition with beta, then I have to look, well, P here is a proper prefix of all of them since for the right side, I look at the black part and the gray part. So I do not remove any uh, additional edge. So what I get is these two edges left. But now what I have here is alpha beta and what I want is AB. So A will be the letter right before S in the image of alpha and B will be the letter right after P in the image of beta. So for the edge one zero, then the letter right before S in the image of one is zero and the letter right after zero one zero in the image of zero followed by zero one is a one. So the edge one zero will become the edge, will become the edge zero one. And similarly, two one will become two and then zero. So I have this. And actually what, what I did was map alpha to the letter A and beta to the letter B. So let's look at another example. So I have another word here, which is basically the same, but S is not the empty word. The first step is the same. So let me just copy all of the extended, uh, the extensions of V. And then I also have to remove some of the edges. As we've seen, well, the second condition here with P will always be satisfied. And since S is the empty word, well, it will also always be a proper suffix of sigma of alpha. So in this case, I don't need to remove any edge. And now I have to map alpha beta to AB. So I have to map alpha to A and beta to B. And on the left side, well, zero will be mapped to the last letter, which is one, and one will be mapped to zero and two will be mapped to zero. So in this case, these two vertices, one and zero will be merged. And I do the same for the right side. And what I get is this new graph. So as we've seen in this example, to obtain the extension graph of U from the extension graph of V, we have two steps. The first step is removing some of the edges. And the second step is applying some graph morphism that will possibly merge some vertices or not. But this second step is well complicated because as I said, it can merge some vertices. So maybe it can create some cycles as we've seen here, but maybe it can also reconnect a graph that was disconnected, but, or it can do nothing or it can do both. Or, so this second step is an annoying kind of. And so actually we will see that we don't need to consider this second step. So let me just introduce this notation here, which is the same notation as the extension graph of V, but I've had it S and P as indices. And this graph here is the graph that we obtain after the first step minus the isolated vertices. So as, as I, I wrote it here as generated by some edges, but we can also see it as, rem well, we removed some vertices. So that's what we did. If S was not a proper suffix of sigma of alpha, then we removed all the edges using this vertex alpha. And the result is that, well, if the word V is dendritic, then all of the extended images of V are dendritic, if and only if these graphs, all the graphs that we obtain after the first steps are connected. And we can also separate it, uh, separate what happens on the left side and what happens on the right side. Uh, so this graph here, since we have the empty word on the right side, that means that we only remove vertices on the left side. And here we, for the second one, we only remove on the right side. And so if these graphs where we only removed on the left or on the right side are connected, then we also have an equivalence here. 
So we don't need the second step. We only need to look at the graphs that we obtain after the first step. The price to pay is that we have to look at all of the extended images at the same time, but that's not a problem in our case because what we're interested in is all, um, all the extended images of all the words. So at some point we would have to do a for all. So we just did it already. So let me just give some uh, special case. If the extension graph of V is such that all of the right vertices are connected to a single left vertex and all of the left vertices are connected to a single right vertex, then no matter which vertices are removed, the graph will still be connected since I ignore the isolated vertices. So that means that the extended images are always dendritic. But these types of graphs are what we have in an Arnold-Rosy language. So in particular, the image of an Arnold-Rosy language under a return morphism is dendritic if and only if the morphism is dendritic. And by result of Dolce and Perrin, we know that in an eventually dendritic language, all the long enough word satisfy this property here. So that means that all the long enough extended images are dendritic and that well, basically the image of an eventually dendritic language is eventually dendritic. And this result here is why we don't need to consider eventually dendritic languages, because when we have an eventually dendritic language and we derive with respect to a long enough word, what we get is a dendritic language. So every eventually dendritic language has an aesthetic representation, which is first some return morphism, and then an aesthetic representation of a dendritic language. And this result here gives us the converse, it tells us that if we take the um, aesthetic representation of a dendritic language and then add at the beginning any return morphism, then what we get is eventually dendritic. So that's why we only need to look for an aesthetic characterization of dendritic languages. And now let me just, um, sorry, put everything together. So the image of a uniformly recurrent dendritic language under a return morphism is dendritic, if and only if the morphism is dendritic, so that's for the initial factors. And we have these two conditions, which are for the extended images. So I've, I've, as you see here, I separated what uh, happens on the left side and on the right side. So I took the third equivalent, equivalence condition, and I just added this for all the, at the beginning. Okay, so now let's summarize what we have. We know that each dendritic language, uniformly recurrent dendritic language, has a, pr a primitive aesthetic representation that was built using our algorithm. And by what we just seen, then at each step, the morphism is a return morphism. And since all the intermediary languages are dendritic, then the conditions are satisfied, the conditions of the previous results are satisfied. So that means that the morphism is actually a dendritic return morphism and the conditions are satisfied at each step. So these are the properties that we know about our sequences and we don't need to know more than that. We have enough information. And what I mean by that is that if a language has a primitive aesthetic representation that satisfies these two conditions, then the language is uniformly recurrent dendritic. So the fact that it is uniformly recurrent comes from the fact that the sequence is primitive. And the fact that it is dendritic comes from these two observations. So I assume that we have some word in our language L. Well, either it is an initial factor or it is an extended image. And if it is an extended image, then it is an extended image of a strictly shorter word, which is in L1. But then this strictly shorter word in L1 is either an initial factor or an extended image of a strictly shorter word in L2 and so on. But since the lengths are strictly decreasing, then this stops. And so any word in L is an extended image of an extended image of some initial factor at some point. But the morphisms are dendritic. So that means that this initial factor is dendritic. 
And the conditions here are satisfied at each step. So that means that the extensions, the extended images of this initial factor are dendritic. And then the extended images of these extended images are also dendritic and so on. And so we come back to our first factor, uh, our first word, and we can say that it is dendritic. And as it's true for any word, then the language is dendritic. So with these two conditions, we have, and, and also the primitive conditions, then we have a characterization of dendritic languages. But what we want to do now is to represent this characterization in a more practical way. And we can do that using a graph. So we will define a graph such that the sequences that satisfy these two conditions are exactly the sequences that label the infinite path in our graphs. Yeah. So the first naive way to build this graph is to say, okay, well, each vertex will correspond to a language and the edges will be labeled by dendritic return morphisms, so that we have the first condition. They will be defined on uh, an alphabet A and go to the same alphabet A, as we've seen we can do it. And they will also satisfy the second condition. So we will have an edge from the image to the language, and I will explain why we go into that direction, if and only if the conditions are satisfied. So why do we need to go from the image to the language? Well, basically the sequence that we want to read in our graph is first sigma zero, then sigma one, then sigma two, and so on. And so the path that we will follow in some, sense, in some way is first L0, then L1, then L2, and so on. But L0 is the image of L1, and then L1 is the image of L2, and so on. So we need to go from the image to the language. But I told you that the point of this graph was to represent our characterization in a more practical way. And this graph is clearly not practical at all. So what we will do now is to focus on the case of a ternary alphabet. So with letters one, two, and three, and we will try and simplify this graph. So since we have a graph, we can work on the vertices and we can work on the edges. So to work on the vertices, we will need to try and understand what are these conditions and when are they satisfied? And to work on the edges, well, Currently, the edges are labeled by all the dendritic return morphisms, but maybe we don't need all of them. And so we will see how we can reduce the set of morphisms. Okay, so let's first look at the vertices. And as I said, we want to understand these two conditions. And more precisely, what we want to do is to associate some object to each language and we want this object to contain all the information that we need. So the conditions, no, depend on sigma, of course, but on the object and not on the whole language. And since we still want to be able to define the edges, well, we want that if two languages have the same object, then the images also have the same object. So that uh, this object defines some equivalence relation and can, in a way, confront our graph. But we have a condition for the left side and a condition for the right side. So instead of associating one object, we'll associate a pair of object, one for the left side and one for the right side. And I will explain what happens for the left side. And I hope you believe me that it's the same for the right side. So if I look at the left side, well, I have to understand this condition here. So this condition has a for all V, okay. And then for all S, we want this graph to be connected. And this graph is obtained from the extension graph of V where we removed some left vertices. Which vertices? Well, it depends on S of course, but Sigma will tell us which vertices we want to remove. So assume that I have this graph. I know I want to know what are the sets of vertices of left vertices that I can remove while still keeping something which is connected. Of course, if I don't remove any vertex, then this graph is connected. And if I remove all of the vertices, 
And since I ignore the isolated vertices, then the graph is also connected. It's empty, so in some sense it's connected. If I remove two left vertices, then I have a unique left vertex remaining. And all of the right vertices are either isolated or connected to this left vertex. So since I ignore isolated vertices, that means that the graph is also always connected. So the only case where I could disconnect the graph is when I remove exactly one left vertex. So we'll now say that a letter is left problematic if removing it in some extension graph will be a problem with this connected graph. So if we look at our example, what happens if we remove the letter B on the left? Well, we have these four edges, these four edges in blue left. And as we can see, the graph is still connected. If we remove the letter C, the vertex C, then we also have four edges in blue, which are remaining and the graph is connected. If we remove the letter A, then the only edges that we have left are these two edges. And as you can see, the graph is not connected. And the pro problem is that the vertices B and C on the left were connected before because B is dendritic, but they're not connected anymore because they were connected by a path that went through the vertex A. And so removing this vertex destroys the path. So that means that the letter A here is problematic. And actually a letter is problematic if and only if it, it is in the middle of a path of length four that connected the other two vertices. So now I will define O, L, as the object, as the set of all left problematic letters. So this is just another way of defining it. And I hope I convinced you that, well, if I know sigma, I know what are the sets of letters that I will try, the set of vertices that I will try to uh, remove. And if I know this object, that I know the set of vertices that I cannot remove. And so knowing these two things, I know exactly when is this condition satisfied. And in addition, well, depending on sigma, either sigma will preserve the set of left problematic letters. So that means that all four objects are equal. Or sigma will modify the set of left problematic letters, but it will modify it in a way that does not depend on the language L. And so that means that these two things are also equal. So in all cases, we have this implication here. So this object actually does what I wanted it to do. And it is clearly simpler than considering all of the languages because there's only a finite number of possibilities. And it's even better than that because in the case of a dendritic language, so still on the ternary alphabet, then there is at most one left problematic letter. So that means that there's actually only four possibilities. Either it is empty, there's no problematic letters, or we only have the letter one, or only the letter two, or only the letter three. And of course, we can do the same for the right side. So we now have these 16 possibilities for the object, the actual object. And as we've seen, well, we can say that the condition now depends on the object and not on the language. And we can also define the image of the object as the object of the image. This gives us a new graph, which has 16 vertices. Still, the edges are labeled by the same morphisms, uh, but now they do not depend on the language, they just depend on the object, but they're defined the same way, except that we work with objects. And as we can see, this graph is already much more practical than the first graph that we obtained. But we can still work on the edges, and that's what we will do now. So actually, when we build our sequences, we have these steps here, the first steps, where we can pick W. And the goal here will be to pick W according to some rules, and always pick W in 
the same way, following the same rules, so that the set of morphisms that we will get here at this step is much smaller than what we had. So the, the easiest way to pick a non-empty word is just to pick a letter. So that will be a first rule. First rule, W is always a letter. Now for the second rule, we need to look at this. So if we have an uniformly recurrent dendritic language, well, the extension graph of the empty word, there's only six possibilities, up to a permutation of the letters, of course. So if I have a dendritic language, then I can apply permutation to uh, ensure that the extension graph of the empty word is one of these six. And then I will pick the letter one and I will derive with respect to the letter one. So this is the second rule, is that W is the letter that corresponds to the letter one. And now I want to know, well, if I apply these rules, what are the morphisms that I will get? So I took here the, the second graph and I will try and see what are the return uh, words for the letter one in this, uh, in this case. So to do that, I represent here the rosy graph of order one. So I will not go into details about rosy graphs, but since I consider the extension graph of the empty word and the rosy graph of order one, these are actually two different ways to represent the same information. It's just that uh, on the left side, well, we have a undirected graph, but with left and right vertices, and this becomes a directed graph. So one, two gives us the edge, one to two, and two, three gives us two, uh, well, not two, one gives us two to one and so on. And we know that uh, every word of the language can be seen as a path in the rosy graph. So it's not an equivalence, but we know that the words are among the paths in this graph. And so in particular, the return words for one are amongst the paths, the paths that go from the vertex one back to the vertex one. So what are these paths? Well, we can start from one and then go directly back. Or we can do one, three, two, and then back. Or we can do one, two, and then back. And these are the only three possibilities. So we have three paths, but we also have three return words and the return words are among the paths. So that means that we only have one possibility. The paths are exactly the return words and we, have, we can associate to it a morphism. What I just did for this extension graph here, I can do for the other five extension graphs. And this is what we get. So for alpha, beta, gamma, and eta, we only have one possibility because we only had three paths and we had to pick three return words among the paths. And for delta and zeta, we have a parameter k. Actually, what we add, we, yeah, we add a loop outside of the vertex one. So we have an infinite number of possibilities. But since we know that we are in a dendritic language, then we have some constraint on the number of time we can take these loops. And so this gives us only these two families of morphisms. And I just define a tree as the set of all these morphisms. So now if I pick W according to my rule, that means that, well, I first apply some permutation and then when I derive, I will get one of these morphisms. And so we now have a simple graph, which has 16 vertices as before. The edges are still defined in the same way. The only difference is that the morphisms that we have are in a smaller set. So this sigma tree is the set of permutations on the alphabet. And then we have the set of morphisms defined on the previous slide. And actually we also have this second permutation here, which is not necessary. We can forget this second permutation, but we can also use it uh, because we have some symmetries in this graph. And so we simplify the graph even more and now we have the final result, which is that a language is uniformly recurrent on a, a ternary dendritic if and only if it has a primitive aesthetic representation that levels an infinite path in this graph, which only has two vertices. So this graph is obviously a practical representation of the characterization. <laughs> 
Okay, so now let me just say a few words about the general case, which is a work in progress with Shunanwa. And for the general case, the way to define this object, OL, is actually in a way similar to what we can observe in the ternary case. So in the ternary case, we said that the letter A here is problematic because we have a path of length four. Here. But what does it mean that we have a path of length four? If we look at the left special words, so the left special words are the words that have at least two left extensions, then we know that all of the prefixes of V are left special and their extensions are A, B, and C. But since we are in a dendritic language, we know that the only other left special words have either VA as a prefix or VB as a prefix, and there's exactly one of each length in these two families, in each family. But if VA is a prefix of U, then the extensions of U can only be AB. And if VB is a prefix, then the extensions of U can only be AC. And so that means that if we fix some length N large enough, and we look at the left extensions of the words of length N, well, we will see one uh, word which has extensions AB and one word which has extension AC. And the letter A is exactly the, interaction, the in intersection of these two sets. Well, the same thing happens in the general case. So you look at, you fix N large enough, and you look at the sets of left extensions and you try and understand the, their interactions, so how they intersect and things like that. And this will give you the information on not only the uh, left problematic letters, but now also the left problematic sets of letters. So this is the ID for the general case. Okay, so related questions to this topic is of course obtaining aesthetic characterization for other families. So the construction using derived languages is already used for some families, but maybe it can also be useful for other families. And a conjecture, which is known as the aesthetic conjecture, is that there exists an aesthetic characterization for the family of languages of at most linear complexity, but we don't even know what is that condition. And of course, since we have found a characterization for dendritic languages and for eventually dendritic languages, well, maybe we can use it to study some of the properties. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Franz. Um, do we have, uh, it was a nice talk. Uh, thank you. Um, do we have questions or remarks for uh, Franz from the audience? No, uh, I have one small question. In your uh, list of questions, at, I mean, open questions at the end, um, I mean, which, is, which, which ones would you um, start with? Or which ones are easier to tackle or? Um... I don't know which one are easier to tackle, but I will try and understand the properties of dendritic. Well, I will focus on the third party, so uh, understand the properties of dendritic languages. And yeah, maybe stability under factorization is the first one I will try and tackle. All right, thank you. Um, well, thank you again for the nice talk. And if there is no more uh, question or uh, remark then